Good evening, everyone. I'm Sean Davies, and I'm Edward Smith Rash, and we'll be your host for tonight. Um, so, that was a great uh, entry. So, yeah, it's just the box singers and the dancers. It's pretty amazing. Uh, well, the room is wonderful. Yeah, so you can see my moves. Yeah. I'd love to. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming out tonight and, uh, well, supporting our event and supporting our speakers because we know we need it. Um, uh, but, you know, the girl, we need you to turn off your cell phones because you really interrupt the microphones and you won't want to interrupt any of these, uh, talks uh, there because they're like this. So, uh, Ed, why don't you give them a rundown of what Ed is? All right, so Ted is a nonprofit organization based on ideas worth spreading. And uh, Ted was established in California 26 years ago, and now it has grown worldwide into an organization that kind of bends the mainstream of ideas and beliefs in our modern world. Uh, so now, since TED Talk is huge, there are many notable names that are doing TED Talk today, and you can pretty much get them for free on TED.com. Yeah, we have, we have names such as like Bill Gates, Jane Goodall, Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, Negozia Conte Reyla, uh, we have Benoit Mendel Bro, we have uh, Sir Richard Branson, former UK Prime Minister uh, Gordon Brown, and they're, they're wonderful. And uh, the three big events every year are the TED Conference in uh, Long Beach, California, every spring, along with its parallel conference, uh, TED Active, in Palm Springs. Now, TED Global is in Edward, Scotland, every summer, so you guys see this uh, TV TED Talk and just a little case and you want more, just head on over to those. Yeah, get the money. <laughs> so, recently, the students, our students were, our juniors, were given the opportunity to create and write and present their own TED Talks. And the, the best, like, the best presentations were picked and chosen for night. And what these students represent is people who think differently, people who pretty much don't ride the mainstream. And amazing students and amazing speakers, so we're so much up for a pretty amazing night. Yeah, I'm really excited. But uh, the, the, all the ideas and TED Talks made tonight were made by the students, and uh, they really wanted to share them with you tonight, and because the ideas were shared, shared. Wait, so what makes an idea worth spreading? Uh, an idea about your friends, an idea about ideals, an idea about creating ideas. And um, we're pretty much here to see so many ideas, and we're up to such a variety of concepts and beliefs. It's going to be pretty exciting. So, who do we up tonight? Uh, first of all, we have Kimberly Remigian. So, let me start off. So, who here has played or plays League of Legends? Hands up. Well, I expect to see more because the, the, the user base of League of Legends players is right now it's around 30 million players. And also, it, there's competitions worldwide and prizes goes up to about around two million dollars. So I'm 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 a League of Legends fan. I watch I watch games, I watch streams, I read guys. I, I want to be good, but I still can't get out of freaking one to one. <laughs> well, I think I know quite a lot about gaming, but Kimberly here is proving me wrong. How much do we really know about gaming? Kimberly on the Ready. Player one. Blink, blink. Enemies are broken. Turn left. Look down. Machine guns. Feet. Red fires. Sprint and duck one. You better call. Guns come from behind. This will jump into the castle. On a mission to save Princess Peach. Jump on a coach and Goomba. Find the key. Unlock the door to back his dungeon. Block. Fire point. Backward kick. Sweet fireball. Great quality. Pause. Are you sure you want to exit without saving? My name is Kimberly Renegan, and today I'm going to talk about games. Online games, video games, arcade games, and graphic games. In fact, who in here has played at least once? Look around you. Most of us have gone through that phase where one game has kept us playing until 3 a.m., and the only reason it wasn't 5 a.m was because of the demand of an English parent or spouse that we set that thing off. So, 
does that make us all gamers? When most people think of a gamer, one of the images he comes to mind. There's the frat boy, who plays GTA, and whose favorite pastime consists of late night clubs. Then, there's the PC aficionado, who maintains a minimum of 24 inches away from the computer screen at all times, due to accessing the abdominal area. And last, but not least, the devil child, habits include aggressive eye pitching and shouting at mom. These are the negative connotations society has established to what makes a person an official gamer. In reality, though, being a gamer can be much more than gaming. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a gamer merely as a person who plays games. So in that sense, yes, we are gamers. But what is a game? Even strictly limiting the subject to electronic games, there are literally thousands out there in countless categories. When I was in middle school, I loved playing Super Mario 64 and Animal Crossing on my way home from school. Contrast that to League of Legends, where it's such a keyboard cooking and blasting mythical creatures to see my brother and to train for hours on end. The different types of games are endless. Just like we wouldn't walk into a restaurant and instantly deem it bad because we see a dish on the menu we don't like, we cannot talk about games as a whole as being negative. Yet, society attempts to defend its stereotyping with three main arguments. The first is that gaming induces violence in kids. True, the idea that violence is contagious is a scary thought. However, at this point, it is only speculation. Joseph Owen, President of the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, claims that there is absolutely no scientific evidence showing a positive correlation between violence in individuals and in the games they play. Referencing studies from the Harvard Medical School Center for Mental Health, the British Medical Journal, and the Journal for Adolescent Health. Yet some people remain skeptical, as there is the misconception that gaming is a solo activity that is lack of social drive and skill. On the contrary, half a billion people in the world play games on a daily basis, with 45% of these people being female. With such a large and diverse population of gamers, gaming has now become an important means of social interaction. As of 2013, 62% of people play with others either online or in person. Companies have transformed their games from initially having no social contact to developing multiplayer options like chat and open mic. And gamers themselves have created a gaming culture where many share the same passions and interests even outside of gaming. The final argument that the public makes against games is that it sends brain growth and development. This could not be further from the truth. Many games require focus, split second decisions, strategy, and perseverance. A study conducted by cognitive neuroscientists at the University of Rochester found that development of the skill set in the virtual world is transferable to the real world as well. With such, the claim benefits go on and on. However, so do the negative perceptions that society has established with gaming, as I mentioned before. With games constantly evolving and becoming increasingly popular, perhaps in 20 years, we can be more certain of its long-term effects. But until then, we need to be patient. We need to be alert. We need to be open-minded. We need to rethink gaming. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it begins today. Thank you. That was great. Well, What's the worst thing you've ever done doing it? Well, I used to be like a hardcore under the YouTube player. Mine was a cheap RB. Yeah, so I grew up with that game before I started having friends. Well, <laughs> well, it was one day I was like so engulfed in the same game, the same as Steam plays, and I was frustrated because I died. Well, died in the game. <laughs> and then I took the controller up, I opened the window, I just flung it off my building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then I was stuck in a paradoxical situation because I just recently threw my controller out of my building, but I still want to play. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I was conflicted and I was like frustrated. 
what am I going to do now? What happened? I didn't, I didn't have faith for the time, so that's yeah. yeah, why so everyone gets like that. So okay. I'm not sure I don't feel like that, you know. Um, well, like, uh, I don't know if you have a new way of calling a friend to just lock up. Same thing with this. Okay, next up we have uh, Katie Stan with The Art of Deception. That sounds like a tiny, mysterious word. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Kim. I am 16 years old, and currently I'm attending International School of Bank. Now, before I get started on my TED Talk today, I would like to present a short little biography about myself. My twin brother and I were born to a mother who died giving birth to us, and to a father who knew a tough pregnancy. Shortly after our birth, we were adopted into two very different families. While I was raised into a life of luxury and privilege, my brother, being adopted by our real loving uncle, was raised on a moisture farm. When I was much older, I had the opportunity to go on a great adventure and meet many different kinds of people, including my brother, who awkwardly fell in love with me, but thankfully, he found out about a relationship before anything I could. Nevertheless, with my newly made friends and brother, we managed to save the galaxy, and I even learned to control the force. Now, at this point, most of you are probably thinking, wait, this sounds awfully familiar. And you're right. This isn't a biography about myself, but rather an account of the fictional character of Princess Leia from the famous series Star Wars. Now, if I hadn't mentioned terms that are unique to Star Wars, such as galaxy and the force, would you have made the connection? Probably not. The priority that I shared with you was an example of deliberate manipulation through language, a technique that is used by the media so frequently and subtly that most of the time you aren't even aware of it. This is what I'll be talking about today, and specifically its uses in advertisements. Now, a very important fact that people often overlook or ignore is that the media is an industry based on one thing and one thing only, money. Therefore, the media often presents misleading information and can steal truth to attract as large of an audience as possible. From the false lines of scientifically proven to the misleading art of euphemism, language and advertisements are all carefully constructed to portray specific idea, but more importantly, to persuade. In three studies conducted by Scott Kervis of the marketing research firm Gallup and Robinson, 240 pairs of advertisers were presented to viewers, who were then asked to choose the advertisement of each pair that was the most persuasive. Here's an example of one of the pairs of advertisers used in one of the studies. Now, looking at these two advertisements for the same product from the same company, which is most persuasive? Is it advertisement A, which uses many rhetorical devices, such as repetition, and positive expressions, such as America's most prescribed acid control medicine, consistently and complete heartburn relief? Or is it advertisement B, which uses no rhetorical devices and uses more negative phrases, such as suffer and potential fierce condition? If you answered advertisement A, you are correct. Advertisement A was actually one of the 120 pairs of advertisements that used rhetorical devices. These advertisements were found to have higher memorability and a much higher persuasion score than those that did not. This result emphasizes how rhetorical devices can be a powerful factor in persuading a consumer to buy or use a certain product. William Lewis, a well-known linguist and author, stated that there are Three main rhetorical devices used by society and especially by the media to persuade us as potential customers. The first device is euphemism, or language designed to mislead, cover up the unpleasant, and specifically designed to alter perception of reality. 
When I was a child, like most children, I went through a phase in which everything I touched was the most secret. Now, at first, I would cry to my mother and say in the most miserable voice of six year old semester, Mommy, I broke you. But as I got older and smarter, I found a way to avoid trouble. Instead of saying, I broke it, I began to state phrases such as, I temporarily dismantled it. And at that time, I didn't think that I was deceiving my mother, rather that I was explaining what had happened in like correct terms. But I mean, personally, I had to the less. And maybe it was because my mother was kind, or because she was deceived by my cunning wit. But she seemed to yell at me less when I was a person question. This technique is mostly currently used in advertisements to replace expressions that are unpleasant rather than uncomfortable, such as in this advertisement for a car rental company. The phrase used is replaced with the expression certified to own. Now, these two phrases mean the same thing, they're both used, but they give us different feelings and emotions. Certified pre-owned gives more of a sense of dependability and trust because of its certification. This takes euphemism and expensive school in advertising. The second rhetorical device is jargon, or the specialized language of a specific group. Have you ever gone to the doctor's office and been given a prescription and if you realize you didn't understand a word of it at all? This recently happened to me when I went to the doctor's office and I received a prescription that stated, abstain from the aggregation of the intake of caffeinated drinks and possible allergies to alleviate arrhythmia. In this case, medical jargon is used, making it difficult for a person like me, who is not medically trained, to understand what was written. And in advertising, this exclusionary language aims in attracting specific members of a group while at the same time repulsing other members that might not understand the phrases given. For example, in this advertisement, phrases such as 200,000 CFM air and Coca-Cola to shake out with their youth, attracting specific members who understand these phrases while at the same time repulsing average members who might not understand the expressive given. The third rhetorical device is inflated language, or language designed to make the ordinary seem extraordinary and the common uncommon. Coca-Cola advertisements are one of the finest illustrations of this device. Nearly every Coca-Cola advertisement introduces the idea that through the uses of their products, a normal, average person can become cool, popular, and the object of affection. And in this specific advertisement, it deliberately states that by merely drinking this soda pop, children have a much higher chance at teaching, of fitting in and gaining something. Now, had that resulted in that for you? All judging aside, Due to the effectiveness of these rhetorical devices in persuading the consumer, language and advertisements are all potentially constructed to manipulate and to convince. And although language is just a small portion of the countless forms of deliberate manipulation, I can tell you to look for these misleading devices used so cleverly by the media and to avoid being misled. Furthermore, I urge you to raise awareness of the subtle form of manipulation. According to Dr. Christine Alblera of the Bowling Green State University, there are a limited number of studies that even recognize the use of rhetorical devices in advertising. The more you are able to bring awareness to this issue and increase the regulation of advertisements, the less you can allow the media to so easily deceive and manipulate us. Thank you. I've been violated. You can see my whole life. Well, how do 
how do we know that she wasn't deceiving us? And that presentation is not deceiving. It's like deceived substance. That, that's too deep. No, that's way too deep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next up we have, uh, what do we call him? Uh, he's called the most side of public speaking, uh, Cole White. <laughs> he's renowned in our school for public speaking, he has and stuff like that. <laughs> well, uh, today he's got his presentation called Structure, which is uh, public speaking about public speaking. Holy love. I planned for this speech. While I was planning for this speech, I received a lot of feedback. I was told that I could walk from one point to another point whenever I transitioned. I was told that I could keep my hand motions within the frame of my chest. I was told that I could start my speech off with a personal anecdote, like how I planned for my speech. Now, a lot of this feedback did help my speech grow. I presented my ideas more clearly. I captured my audience's attention. And overall, I appeared to be a more confident speaker. But there was a point when I had to ask, what is this doing to my speech? It seemed to me that the emphasis of the editing process had gone from what I would say to how I said it. Now, this wasn't the first time that I experienced this level of disconnect. My own ideas. I went to the University of Texas to do a speaking workshop. And while I was there, I was told that I couldn't have four pieces of evidence because people seem to like the magic number three. I was told to people because for some reason I come across as angry. It didn't seem to matter if my fourth piece of evidence supported what I was saying or if I was convicted about my idea. I still have to follow the structure. My ideas were being compromised by what someone else said that I needed. Now, I'm not saying that structure would be bad. Structure helps things stay upright. And in speaking, structure is a foundation for us to build up our speeches. But it is not a point of how high they can go. At the point that we subtract from our ideas and plug it into a mathematical formula, we're no longer giving our own speech. We are filling in blank. Now, why? Why has humanity's most powerful form of communication no longer about communicating with each other? According to an article from October of 2012 in the Daily Mail, people are more afraid of public speaking than snakes, spiders, and even death. This means that people are more afraid of standing up in front of each other and sharing their ideas than ceasing to exist. <laughs> so how this relates to structure is that there is a psychological phenomenon called avoidance. Now what avoidance is essentially is that people will avoid situations of which they might receive personal criticism. So what structure does is that it alleviates a little bit of that fear by making a barrier between the person laying bare their ideas and the other. It is a crutch for the people who are afraid of public speaking, which granted is the majority of people, and the personal criticism that they might receive on what they have said. Now, if our ideas is our presentation to the world, then what we say is important. If humans couldn't express their ideas fully, the world would be a very different place. Let's take 1984, for example. 1984 by George Orwell is a book that features Winston Smith, a man that can be shot or killed by the thought police just for saying what he thinks. Now we live in a society of free information. I can say or think whatever I want most of the time. However, at the point that we edit ourselves, because of our own crippling fear of what other people have to say, we become our own big brother. The only censor is ourselves. Now, history has shown that the people that say their ideas, how they want them to be heard, do make a difference. In fact, the famous words, I don't have a dream, were edited out of Martin Luther King's first few drafts. The only reason that he 
stood in front of his, his nation and said those famous words was because his friend, the Hollywood Jackson, said to him, Hey, tell them about your dream. Now, fourthly, you can have a fourth point. You have an idea, and whether or not it's a good one, you should do it with the world. You need to be the person who won because they thought outside the box. You need to be Winston Smith and fight against your own personal big brother. You need to be the person who defines structure despite what other people say. Be your own idea. Thank you. Yeah, I got goosebumps. Just, 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 Next up, we have uh, Ryan Jones. Let's put it down. Let's talk about phone use. In my hand, I hold a device. A device that comes in all shapes and sizes. This device is not lover. It will not reciprocate and tell us how hot it is in the world. It will make us dinner when we're hungry. I'm Ryan Jones. Here today to talk about technology's impact on the world today. We are responsible for how we handle technology, whether we choose to make it addictive or social. We cannot expect technology to make us happier, healthier, and more productive people. This is a David Jones. No relation. He's six foot eight. He's starting to center on his basketball team. Yet, he's not only renowned for his height. He's also at the top of his class. His coaches had high hopes for Xavier. They knew he was going to After doing drills at practice, Xavier was through the pass and quit. He didn't get back up. Xavier had a stroke. Team stared in shock, turned to the coach, pulled this device out of his pocket, saved Xavier's life. So how did he save? You see, he had recently, in fact, the night before, bought an app called Sony for $1.99, a CPR app in which individuals with previous CPR knowledge can press the money to make the right calls when it's safe. Because of his coach and this device, Xavier's was alive today. So, I want to talk about another situation in which this device is used. Like Xavier, Savannah Ness is also the top of her class. Ms. Shaw Ashley, she had recently just turned 16 and received her license the day after. You see, Savannah was dedicated to her family. She always put herself, herself, themselves before herself. After happily agreeing to get groceries for her family, Savannah, for one moment, decided to pay more attention to the keyboard on her screen than the, eye, the safety of the room. Then he decided to stop. Next thing that happened, the man had died by collision with that same driver. How is it that when we use this device, we can save lives just as easily as we can end it? And take Google, for instance. Put your hands up if you used Google in the last three weeks. Keep them up if you used it in the last three days. Okay? How about the last three to five hours? Look around. It. Are you aware that in 2013, 2.2 trillion searches were made off Google, according to that firm, Google's official history book? Probably thinking, what did I search in 2013? More importantly, how much of it have I been searching? Are you aware that Google is constantly selling your data to private corporations and businesses to digitally market? Pretty scary stuff, right? I mean, you can't just stop using Google, use it for school. Use it to find critical information in a short period of time. 
I mean, who goes to the library anymore to look up stuff? So, at the end of the talk, I want you to come, go, walk away, two solutions. How you handle these devices when you're with others and when you're with yourself. When you're with others, you need to make sure that these devices are less important than them. Take this photo thing. What's the point of going to dinner with your family if you're just going to stare at a device and avoid social interaction? I mean, if you use our devices by ourselves, no problem. We're not offending anyone. Yet, we need to be aware of how addicting it can be. Many of us, including myself, convinced my parents to get me a phone by saying, oh, I'll need it in this emergency. So, what happens if you all have been playing Angry Birds and uploading all photos to Instagram for five hours and you can't make an emergency call when you actually need help? We seem more like a family. Instead of zoning out, we actually talk to our friends and family. Instead of zoning out, we actually talk about our favorite part of the day. Maybe what we learned at school. We're not going to sit there and zone out our devices. Cut In the end, what will matter more? Your friends, your family, or this? So please, put it down. Thank you. I don't know if I can do it. Yeah, well, my phone is calling my family, so yeah. I'm doing great, you love me. That's enough for me. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I kind of love Siri, too. <laughs> so, uh, what's the word next? We have Matt working out here in the seat, and he'll be talking about his trip in comedy. Yep. Yeah. Nice <laughs> Good evening, everybody. All humans share something in common, and it's that we all love to laugh. In fact, it's programmed in our brains for us to enjoy laughing, and that's why comedy and the occupation of comedians had emerged in the first place. Now, as you all probably know, a comedian is a person who makes people laugh. And it's really interesting how the comedian actually achieves the goal of making people laugh. Because there's so many different ways, so many different styles, techniques, and methods of achieving this goal of triggering laughter. But there's one dominant tool that the majority of comedians in the world use. Now, with the exception of Rowan Atkinson's Atkinson character, Mr. Bean, the majority of comedians use words as their tools to make people laugh through their jokes or funny stories. And the perfect word, every single story, the comedian's able to express all of his ideas through his jokes and stories with any word he wants to or she wants to. And the audience who listens, enjoys listening, and laughs as a result. Everyone wins. But then there are these people. These people who have the power to decide what words comedians can and cannot use. These people who have the power to decide what words are heard and unheard. What's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And they decide all of this for all of you on their own behalf. These people censor out certain words that they hear in the media, words that they don't like, and words that, that are deemed as bad in society. Even if these words are used humorously in a comedian's routine as a joke, they still take it seriously and take it off the air. The FCC is just one of many examples of these types of organizations. They will hunt down every time one of these words has occurred in the media, and they will take it down and censor it. I'm sure you've all heard that before. But anyways, with that in, with that in mind, Truly, the only lucky audience of a comedian has got to be the live audience. You know, other than being, you know, watching watching TV at home or like watching comedian on DVD on censored, the live audience gets to see the comedian 3D in person rather than being on a plasma screen TV 2D screen. But what's more important is that they hear every single word that the comedian says, uncensored, unchanged, unaltered. They get to hear the version of the routine just as the comedian wanted them to hear. And like I mentioned, there's also people who watch uncensored comedy routines on DVD or YouTube, like myself. But what about people who watch censored comedy routines on television? What about people who are listening to censored comedy routines on the radio? They're being
Everything that goes to a faith shows an altered version of this medium routine. The version of the comedian has never intended for them to listen to. With that being in mind, it's actually really fascinating how much effort it takes to make a successful comedian's comedy routine. Not just the dictum, but everything. Basically, the jokes, the story, the comedian has to master this through years and years of practicing and studying comedy. So I say that comedy is actually a valid art. With that being said, imagine if you went up to this painter right here, Bob Ross. Imagine if you went up to Bob Ross, went up to him, took away his paintbrush, and told him to paint the same exact thing without the paintbrush, and just took them. Imagine his reaction. Well, if I were him, I think I'd be pretty angry. What you're doing for me is, is you're taking a tool away from me that I use to perform a certain job. Like, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're not supposed to do that. That's my tool. And that's the same relationship comedians have with their words. To take away the words of a comedian is like taking away one of the most important things in a comedian's life. Take away that ability is literally so insulting. It's insulting to every single one of these people who practice for hours and hours and have written the comedian and have written their routines for so long and have actually mastered the art of comedy over years and years of training. In fact, sometimes in comedy senses, you don't even know what the comedian is talking about anymore. Because some of the words that comedians use that are censored are actually key words that are being censored. Please, let me show you what I mean. Is indecent, profane, obscene, blue, off color, <laughs> risque, suggestive, <laughs> cursing, cussing, swearing, and all I could think of. <laughs> that was George Carlin, one of my favorite comedians, and his list of the seven most filthiest words you can think of. Did you hear the audience laugh? Yeah, apparently they heard something really funny. <laughs> they laughed. <laughs> because instead of hearing something meaningful that George Carlin had to say, all oh, you guys heard was a 1,000 hertz sound wave that probably just hurt your ears. It was pretty loud. It hurt mine too. You know? and with this, you know, you can't even judge whether it's funny or not. You didn't get to hear the entire routine. So basically, your sense of humor doesn't even apply to you. It didn't even have an opportunity to decide whether this was truly funny or not. And this is just kind of, this is one of the routines that I'd like to call Triple routine because, like me, I'm a triple. Be, you know, being a triple myself, I'm not able to do things that I normally can do. I can't even stand up and give this head talk properly. I can't even walk without my touches properly. Looks pretty silly, right? And that's the same thing that happens with the comedian's routine. Once it's censored, it's not the same anymore. Censorship in comedy does not make society a better place. It's, I don't know why people think of it that way. Honestly, because all that it does is that it gives, old, it gives new audiences bad first impressions of the comedian. It makes old audiences annoyed, knowing that comedians that are so great and so talented and can really make people laugh are being censored and not able to show their full potential to, to an audience. And most of all, it hurts the comedian. It hurts the comedian who's invested hundreds and hundreds of hours practicing public speaking. He or she spent hundreds and hundreds of hours writing out comedy material, spent so many years practicing public, public speaking and matching the art of comedy. It's insulting to even censor these words. Because of that, I think that sens the censorship of comedy, I think that the belief that censorship of comedy, which makes society better, is totally contradictory. What? You're going to make the world a better place if less people laugh? No. Don't think it works that way. Because when comedy is censored, it's just nobody wins. There is no winner. There are no winners at all, only, and there's only less of losers. The efforts of the comedians are being thrown away just indifferently, and the audience are being deprived of laughter. But most importantly, the art of comedy is being degraded. So, please, don't be that broadcasting executive who, who decides to censor certain words in a joke just because you're seen outside as, as something that's bad for you to say. You're using it humorously to make people laugh. Please, don't be that politician or lawmaker or whatever who makes laws about what words can and cannot be used and what words can or cannot be heard in the media. It is in a joke. And most importantly, please remember this in this TED Talk. Please, don't be that person who allows yourself to stoop so low as to be insulted by a word just because of its meaning, without even considering what context it's used in. Especially if it's used in a 
help. Uh, so, please, do be reasonable, be rational, and have a sense of humor. Just understand that words are nothing without the context that they're using, and that at the end of the day, a joke is simply just what it is. A joke. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm kind of proud of you. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, now I'm, I'm really proud of the first half of our event. Really and uh, really proud of the speakers as well. But right now we have a break. And feel free to go outside. And uh, down in the foyer we have food. And uh, if you go to leave the theater, go to your right. Uh, there's that room. So All right. So uh, please, when you come back in, please make sure you turn off your phone. Uh, when you come back in again. Also, the food provided is by uh, our nonprofit profit ISD Club. So, I, I hope you feel not guilty for buying these fatty foods. And, um, well, if some of you wanted to still stay here, you could, uh, there's going to be a TED Talk by Adora, Adora Sikta, and she's going to be talking about what adults can learn from kids. Um, yeah, we have to set, and so, uh, if you want to come in later, we'll have an announcement. Thank you, Dean. All right, thank you all for coming in. Please take your seats. And let's make sure all your phones are off because you don't want to miss the second half. Yeah, we're getting some feedback. Yeah. Uh, oh, also, if you have any food in here, we can't have any food. So, okay, right. <laughs> and, uh, well, that was a great first half, and I'll start in the second half. And we have Val, who needs to help me with this last half. Yeah, Val, Val Tanad, and she's going to be talking about PSC. Does that sound weird, PSC? No, I have no idea. I have no idea at all. All right. Well, thank you all for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. And that is now the 20 seconds of silence. An unbelievably short amount of time that caused many of you to fidget and be uncomfortable. Silence that lingers is deemed as awkward because we do not like silence. Silence scares us, makes us uncomfortable, and renders us at a loss. So, what to do? And how to So, what is silence? Silence is a lack of silence. In the physical and external world, silence is lack of sex and screams and cars honking, music playing. But silence can also exist in the internal self. It is the lack of influences of others, of thoughts, of perceptions, of the byproduct of external factors. It is the ability to see something and not have a pre-existing value tied into it. Yet, everywhere we look, we see thoughts and hear thoughts and absorb thoughts. Silence cannot exist when the thoughts of different individuals are enforced upon us at every single moment of our lives. When, no matter what we come across, a message to And so, like a rare, exotic animal, silence is endangered and is becoming extinct. Even though there may be no sound around us, silence still does not exist because sound, in the form of other people's thoughts, are everywhere. And why? A two words for you. Mass media. When you dare walk a chance to president of marketing before, we encounter about 5,000 ads per day. Regardless of whether or not we notice and remember all those ads, they're there. Each ad that we see expresses multiple messages about the world we live in, which has values to everything that we encounter. In turn, those 
messages weave their way through our internal world and eliminate power for them. They live, breathe, and speak to us like you. You're looking at me now, and automatically associate me being Asian. My small eyes, black hair, and yellow skin. You also see me as a girl, and associate me as being weaker than guys, and you're protected. This is the result of media and its ubiquity, its infinite forms of connotations. It is everywhere. No wonder if that is not a good. Caltanic, where the media constantly imposes hundreds and thousands of beliefs upon us in our daily lives. But if the suffering portrayed by the media cannot be physically heard, they have an enormous impact on us. Unconsciously, we are molded into who we are by the media and the values that it depicts. We are molded by the way businesses portray the world and their desire to make profit. Molded by the way others respond to that portrayal, and molded by the way those others judge the people around them. It's as if there is constantly a little voice inside our heads whispering orders and directing us to behave a certain way. As a result of mass media, we face judgment everywhere we turn, in every breath we take, and every action we make. So why is science the point? Because this is what the lack of science does for us. And this. According to multiple health, government health organizations, Roughly 120 million people worldwide suffer from depression, and another 70 million from eating disorders. We allow the noises to affect us, to change us, to potentially harm us and destroy us. The messages in mass media have the potential to wreak havoc. People are not satisfied with who they are and feel the need to alter themselves to fit the standards of society. This, all this, is the result. But why then is science is so important that we overlook it? And why then does science fail? We overlook the concept of science because we do not even realize or notice what science is and what the absence of science means. And we have been throughout science for so long that science now fears us and makes us uncomfortable. We do not know who we are without the comfort thoughts and expectations of others. This is it. At any moment, we are not judged and do not struggle to be loved and accepted and understood. And at that moment, we do not know why we do everything. According to Digital Insights, in a single day, 15 billion photos are uploaded on Instagram. How many of those are edited to look better? How many are hashtags get more likes? We can no longer be who we are because we fear the noises around us. Because we are willing to do anything to accept it in life. It is sad that we can no longer live without noises. Sad that we crave for acceptance so much that we are constantly stepping through the thoughts and expectations of others. Sad that thoughts are no longer ours alone, but are the voices of hundreds of thousands of others. And sad that the media has taken over all aspects of our lives and our silence is there. We can no longer truly be ourselves in those little time to think and reflect. And so I leave you with this. Let some silence into your lives. Focus on your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. Just you. Take a step back and look around. Realize that sometimes it really is all about you and no one else. Don't change on behalf of another, but for yourself. And for a few minutes each day, live without the influences of others and embrace them. Thank you. So I'm guessing we have some team styles? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, uh, I just like half my teachers think I have the same problem as the media, like the country style, but all right. I think we both can't keep style. All right. Um, next up, we have Ethos Bazaar on a more serious note, especially for our international community. It's a uh, Middle Eastern and Muslim stereotypes in media. All right. I hope you guys enjoy.
Hi everyone, my name is Isha Sazal. I was born in Pakistan, I'm 16 years old, and I've been going to international schools all my life. So far, I've lived in three continents and five different countries, and I've noticed that Muslims and Middle Easterners are almost always depicted offensively in movies, television shows, even in video games. Whether it's the Libyan Carter who shot down the dock in Back to the Future, or a cutscene from Call of Duty, Muslims and Middle Easterners are shown to be violent, uncivilized, and unpredictable in Western media. And these endless negative portrayals range from silent movies and cartoons to modern day blockbusters. Even Walt Disney's Aladdin contains stereotypical Arab personalities. In the theatrical version of Aladdin, the opening lyrics to the song were, Oh, I come from a land, from a land far away, where the caravan camels roam, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric. But hey, it's home. Now, of course, did we change these lyrics? After the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee voiced their opinions, but they should have changed more than just the song. In one scene, a merchant threatens to cut off Princess Jasmine's hand because she takes an apple to feed a starving boy. Now, this man isn't the main villain of the film. He isn't even one of Jafar's heroes. He's just an average Arab merchant. So when an eight-year-old in America is watching her favorite Disney movie and she sees this man pull out his knife to cut off her beloved princess's hand, she is going to think that all grown men with beards who wear traditional Arab clothing are aggressive, short-tempered, and will cut off your hand with slightly anger. For that eight-year-old who knows nothing about the Middle East, it may seem like the whole area is villainous and filled with cruel people. But in reality, it's a place rich in culture, with beautiful architecture, and all kinds of amazing people. Now, as I said earlier, I'm from Pakistan, which is in South Asia, right between India and the Middle East. So, of course, Pakistan and the Middle East have a few similarities. One of them is that both places are mostly populated by Muslims. So, stereotypes aimed at the Middle East affect Pakistanis as well as other Muslims all over the world. According to research done by the Gallup Paul in 2010, more than 40% of Americans admitted to having at least slightly prejudiced feelings towards Muslims. That's more than twice the number of Americans who admitted to those same feelings towards Christians or Jewish people. And it doesn't stop there. More than 52% of Muslim Americans so that government anti-terrorism policies in the U.S. single out Muslims for surveillance and monitoring. This is my dad. That's me sitting right there. He looks away from him. As you can see, I obviously get my good looks from him. He told me to say that. Anyway, my dad is a U.S. citizen. Because of his job, he's traveled all over the world. So his passport is like this thing. Most of the extended family lives in the U.S., so every year my family and I travel over there to go visit them. But when we land at JFK Airport, more often than not, my dad is pulled aside by additional questioning. Now these searches are supposed to be random, but according to Pew Research Center, more than 21% of Muslim Americans claim to have been singled out by airport security. That's not random, that's racial profiling. Because my dad is a Muslim, middle-aged male who was born in Pakistan and has an Arabic name, he is automatically a suspect. And not only is he a suspect, but he is a victim of Muslim and Middle Eastern stereotyping. Now, stereotypes aren't always bad. Generalizations help us know what to expect when we meet someone or go somewhere new. But when exaggerated negative images of a person override the positive images, it can be damaging. According to research done by Jack Shaheen, a professor at Southern Illinois University, out of a thousand films from 1896 to 2007 that contained Middle Eastern references, 
12 were positive, 52 were neutral, and over 900 were negative. Paladin was one of the positive ones. As members of an international school community, we are taught to be accepting and tolerant towards every religion, culture, and belief. So when we see Hollywood openly offend Muslims and Middle Easterners, shouldn't we be doing something about it? As Ellie Wiesel said, to remain silent and indifferent is the greatest sin of all. So when you're sitting at home watching television and you see a Middle Eastern stereotype, contact the media outlet and speak out. If you're watching television and you see an African American stereotype, contact the media outlet and speak out. If you're watching television and you see a Southeast Asian stereotype, contact the media outlet and speak out. If you're watching television or a movie or playing a video game that contains any kind of stereotype, please contact the media outlet and speak out. Because if we, as members of the international school community, don't help put an end to these hurtful images, then who will? Thank you. Great stuff, you know, pretty relevant to our international community. Yeah, I think we have the students who have our seat. Yeah, I feel like a student body is pretty together in our way we can come. But next up, we have Dan McPherson. So, I'm going to decay morality. And uh, do you think our morality, our morality is the way we have a time? Or that's what we're saying we have morals in the first place. That's right. Yeah. All right, thank you. I mean, what? Good evening. My name is Sam McPherson. I'm here tonight to talk to you about the decay of morality in society. How many of you have heard of old TV shows like Little Rascals? Come on, raise your hands. Anybody? Yeah. What about uh, Leave It to Be There? Another classic. And uh, Hands Up to Go with the Giant. There we go. Now, as you may remember, back then, the most profane statements on television were, Ah, oh, stuff, and do you will to Things have changed a lot since then. Here's a clip from a more recent film entitled Ocean 12, released in 2004. This clip is a comical message from the director about the increasing use of profanity in our generation. He intentionally sets it out the profane language to not only keep the movie family friendly, but to send an important message as well. This don't bother you. Of course it bothers me, mate. But what the f do you want me to do about it? Well, it's f up. You can't hear none of the lyrics. You can't even get with the beat with all them bleeps in it. If you want to sing it on the radio, this is what you're gonna have to do. Well, it's f isn't it? It's totally f***ing right. It's f***ing. F what the f is that? So I'm going to think too. The foundation of society was rocked by the release of the genie. The 
mechanical engineer, the new AI, borrowed the name from bikini design, from bikini of coal, for post war testing on the atomic bomb and taking place. As you can imagine, people exploded in response. <laughs> <laughs> Society was shocked. They viewed the bikini design as beyond scandalous. Just when the eyes thought the design was going to go down in flames, movie stars and models began to wear the design, appearing in advertisements in movies. And as a consequence, the design became gradually more and more popular. Nowadays, you go to any booth, and I guarantee you'll find loads of women who maybe you see men just in the scene. And finally, our image of beauty has shocking the period over the years. The media floods us with images and films filled with supernaturally perfect people. In 2013, Wolverine, for example, Hugh Jackman's bulging biceps turned the eyes every viewer. But here's an interesting text. Before any model's face appears on the cover of a magazine or an actor on the theater screen, they're put through hours of scrutinizing from makeup artists and hairstylists. Then, a computer animation specialist goes to work for hours more until the person is barely recognizable. It's no wonder why our perception of beauty is so distorted. You're in the front row. You're probably thinking something like, so what? Why is it so bad? It places unbelievable pressure on the rising generation to choose the media's interpretation of the perfect body. Deborah Trent from the General Consumer Research says that advertisements promoting beauty-enhancing products rather than problem-solving ones are likely to remind us of our own shortcomings. This is the source of many disorders such as depression, anorexia, bulimia, and so on. The best of all room. Now, I'm sure more than a few are probably thinking, gee whiz, look at those muscles. <laughs> but an inside look on his diet reveals what he had to go through to achieve the immediate interpretation of the perfect body. He ate well over 7,000 calories every single day. I think you're a every few hours. From personal experience, I found that teenagers like myself force themselves mentally and physically to achieve the media's interpretation of the perfect experience. As I've shown you here today, the media has lowered its standards between what is and what isn't appropriate. And as a consequence, our standards have been lowered as well. The only way to help prevent depression and repair a deteriorating language is to repair a perception of morality. I'm not asking for rebellion. I just want you to be aware. Keep your language in check. And the next time you see a beauty ad or a finish magazine, keep in mind that most likely you're on a phone with the Thank you. Talking about awareness, I'm always getting tired of like, filtering out all the inappropriate jokes in my head when I'm sitting down here. Yeah, we had a lot. We had a lot. We had a lot. Next up, we have Steel. And so we're speaking of how to not pick up girls. Oh, Steel, Steel, the same. Ah, I'm listening to you. No, not the name of this one. Yeah. You see it? Hi, I'm Phil. I'm 16. Um, I'm really cold. Uh, and today I'm going to be teaching guys on how not to pick up girls. So, two weekends ago, I was standing outside a Japanese bistro waiting for a taxi. So imagine it's 9 p.m., dark, I'm standing on the side of the road next to my 5'2 friend, and suddenly two men on a motorcycle swerve by, stop right in front of us, yell, woohoo, and then drive off. <laughs> Funny, right? But I felt as if I was being undressed by strangers decades older than me at 9 p.m. on the side of the road. And just last weekend, I was walking from Subway back into Nichita, and I hear I turn to my left, assuming it was a cat, and I see an old man smirking at me. And just two days ago, after practice, I was walking my dog outside the U.S. Embassy compound. 
and I hear Confused whether this noise was addressing me or my dog, I turn around and I see 10 pairs of construction worker eyes leering in my direction. The truth is, none of these men called me sexy. None of them asked me to go home with them. None of them asked me for my number. They didn't call me any misogynistic terms, try to touch me, or sexually insult me in any way. Instead, what they did was use animalistic noises to communicate dirty and sexual motives. These men call out to women like me as if we are an inferior group of humans pleading for male approval, as if we are exclusively toys for male eyes, male hands, and male manipulation. These noises turn women into this transparent object of sexual beauty and desire. By, by whistling, hooting, and hollering, you are still they were still communicating an idea. It doesn't matter that they didn't use words recognized in the English dictionary. People think by sounding something out and rather saying it, they're getting, they're getting away with it, but they're not. It's still communicating this idea of verbal harassment. While researching my topic, I stumbled across the works of a man called Jason Kurtz, and he said something very interesting. He said, when we think of racial issues in the US, we think of Latino, Black, or Asian issues. So when we think of issues regarding sexual orientation, we think of gay or bisexual issues. So when we think of gender issues, we think of women issues. And I think this is the core of the problem in gender issues where the dominant group is being disregarded. And I can assure you that gender issues are not only women's issues. So I released a survey a couple weeks ago, and this was a survey to the high school students, and these are responses from both males and females for ages 14 to 18. When I filtered out the survey about who had ever been catcalled, you can see more than 80% of these responses were female. When I, when I filtered out the question, do you think catcalling is a compliment by female answers, you can see around 50% say no catcalling is a compliment. The second largest cohort said sometimes if they do it in the right manner. But let's not forget that females who had been catcalled and had never been catcalled answered the survey. Keep this image in mind. These are the male answers, significantly different from the female answers. More than 50% say sometimes it's okay to catcall, but the second largest cohort said yes. But how can you quantify and qualify what is the right manner for each individual? How can you say that, yes, if I catcall that person, it's okay, and if I catcall that person, it's not okay? In 2000, the UN Health and Millennium Summit Conference. In this conference, they created eight different development goals. So first, Eradicate extreme hunger and poverty. The second, achieve universal primary education. The third, promote gender equality and empower women. This came above, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, and all these important development goals. And this is because when you empower women and promote gender equality, there are better social circumstances. But how can we do this when even the most developed parts of our society like ISD, can't recognize gender inequality. The goal date, 2015, the year I graduated. This is not the world that I want to grow up in. But this is. I'm 16, living in an affluent community, surrounded by intellectual and capable peers. But not even the wealthiest of places and powerful people can protect me from being exposed to some form of inequality. So tell me, what is it like for that Latina girl to commute to school every day through her slum community? 
What is it like for that petite Indian woman to board the bus to her night shift? And what is it like even for my best friend to commute to school within Bronx? So boys, if you were still wondering on how not to pick up girls, this would be it. Thank you. Thank you. 